Good evening, everybody. Keep enjoying your meals. No rush on that at all. Uh, my name is Jay Jelinek. I'm going to be the MC for this evening. I got a little nervous when I saw Brother John taking off the other direction um, as I'm about to kick this off. No, no, no. So this is not a mistake. These sweaters. If you're wearing a sweater like I am, please stand. This is in honor of Brother John. We all know what that story is about, right? By the way, this is a toasting, not a roasting this evening, so no reason to be nervous. Um, we are here to uh, enjoy um, the Green family, Brother John, Catherine, for the 50 years of dedicated service they've had over the years and the impact they have made, not only, not only locally, but globally. So to see the table in front of us with the Green family and the extended family all right there is just an amazing deal. And we're gonna sit back, we're gonna have a little fun and enjoy this evening in memory of them. So with that said, please sit back and enjoy your meal. I'm gonna ask Mr. Do Dr. Walt Scalen to come up, please. And uh, we're gonna celebrate a bit of the history for Bro uh, Pastor John's tenure. What a beautiful family this is right here. Can I get an amen on that? What a beautiful family. Now, John and Catherine, what do you think about the rest of your beautiful family? <laughs> you know, John, I uh, met you sometime in late 1981 or maybe early 82, I can't remember. But um, since that time, your hair has never moved. <laughs> I, think, I think that's one of the seven wonders of the world. <laughs> one of the seven mysteries of the world is where my hair went. Seriously, thank you. Thank you for being a friend, for coming to visit me in the hospital, for praying with me, for doing so many things, for teaching, for I can't name them all. But I'm going to talk about your history, and this history was written. You might get comfortable. We're talking 50 years here, people. But um, I think it'll go about 10 minutes or so. Uh, I didn't write it. It was written by Betty McGee and Carolyn Tinkle. I think they put it together. And Todd made it into a narrative. So here we go. Oh, before I read it, let me just say one personal thing. Every ending is a new beginning. Harmony Hill Baptist Church has a unique privilege tonight in honoring our pastor for 50 years of faithful ministry. Is this coming out okay or am I getting feedback? Okay. It was tea, right? <clears throat> Pastor John surrendered to preach in 1968 in Hope, Arkansas, and, uh, and was ordained at Garrett Memorial Baptist Church in 1972. In May of 1972, John married Catherine Rose Smith in Port Arthur, Texas. That's where Mary Jane and I were both born. When I saw that, I couldn't believe it. In November of that year, what was then known as First Baptist Church of Harmony Hill, 
extended the call to be, to be pastor to John Green. We are so thankful that he accepted the call to pastor Harmony Hill on November 19, 1972. In the 50 years since he accepted the call to shepherd our church, the Lord has blessed our church and our city through his leadership. When Pastor John and Catherine arrived, the reputation of the church was that there was anything but harmony on the hill. I heard about that. Um, Pastor John committed to preaching the gospel, loving the membership, and leading the church to make door-to-door -door visitation. In those early years, the Lord began to bless these commitments, and in five years, the church had grown to 300 in enrollment. One story from these early years is that Pastor John came under conviction that he had not been baptized after his genuine conversion in his dorm room in college. He stepped down during the invitation and told the church of his conviction to be baptized in the right order. He was very nervous, wondering if they would fire him for being an unbaptized Baptist preacher. <laughs> Instead, it prompted several church leaders to either confess Christ or be baptized. It was this spirit of obedience and humility that forged the bond between pastor and church members. By the late 80s, the church had grown to around 700. This was facilitated by John leading the church to plan for growth through an expansion of the campus and starting multiple services. A new auditorium was completed in 1976, which is today used as the Children's Building Treehouse. A second service was begun in the mid-1980s in order to accommodate the increased attendance as people were parking down Chestnut Drive all the way down to Lowe's. Wow. Pastor John knew that the church needed more land in order to grow through the addition of parking and future facilities, yet the church remained landlocked. The church began praying and fasting in order to ask the Lord to grant the church favor with a woman who owned 23 acres of land surrounding the church. Pastor John had been previously told by the woman that she had promised her mother on her deathbed that she would not sell the land. It was also during this time period that Pastor John had been invited in view of a call to another church. Act, that church actually voted him in as pastor, before you said yes, I guess, with a 100% vote of the membership. Yet the Lord spoke to Pastor John and promised him that if he stayed on the hill, God would bless him. Pastor John turned down that other church. Shortly after making the decision to stay, the woman who owned the 23 acres called to offer the land to the church. In June of 1987, the church built a two-story education fellowship hall building. This building served as a place for Wednesday night meals, youth group gatherings, and potluck lunches. It was also in the 1980s that Pastor John started the Faith Promise Missions Program to strategically fund missions efforts. This further solidified the intentional support, intentional support of missions and missionaries that is so deeply embedded in our church today. Longtime Harmony Hill members will remember supporting names like Arnold Skelton, I remember hearing him speak, Michael Gott, him too, Barry and Kim Bennett, Gloria, Gloria Russell, Children's Ministry, Samaritan's Purse, Billy Graham's Evangelistic Association, and many other short-term and long-term missionary partners. Pastor John has long spoken of how the church's support of global missions has been a key part of why the Lord keeps blessing the hill. In the 1990s, the church continued to grow, and Pastor John was honored with a Doctor of Divinity from the New World Theological Seminary of, <clears throat> of Tex Texarkana, or 21 years of pastoral ministry and church growth. <coughs> Pardon me. Pastor John was honored by the church 
for his 25th anniversary and a collection of sermons were made into the book, Grace for Today, Hope for Tomorrow. I was there, John, and I remember how thrilled you were to get that book. The church continued to focus on outreach events in the community to win souls for the Lord. In 1996, the church launched an Easter program called Reach Lufkin Now. The event was a huge success, drawing 4,500 people in attendance. The previous record at the Civic Center for a worship service had been 1,135. The church also had a vision for Christian education and began Harmony Christian School. The school operated for 19 years and impacted many families with the value of Christian education. Y'all still with me? All right, hang in there. 50 years we're talking about here, you know. The late 90s also signaled another shift for growth under Pastor John's leadership. Wednesday night prayer meeting was starting to decline. If there were 700 adults in worship on Sunday morning, there may be only 60 in attendance on a Wednesday night. That's a pretty good Wednesday night for most churches. Uh, Pastor, back then, Pastor John asked the church to give him permission to train up Bible study leaders and begin life groups in people's homes around the city that would meet on Wednesday nights. He said that if in one year there were not more people in the groups that had been attending the prayer service, then he would revert back to a Wednesday night service. By the end of that first year, there were over 200 people attending small groups and the church never looked back. Today, life groups are an essential part of who we are as a church. At the turn of the century, the church was poised for a new chapter under Pastor John's leadership. Our current worship center was completed in 2001 with a library, classrooms, the Heavenly Grounds Cafe. <laughs> I still think that's funny, I'm sorry. <laughs> Shortly after that building was completed, the current student building was built around 2002. Also in 2002, the church affiliated with the Southern Baptist of Texas Convention and became a recognized giver to missions through the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. The early 2000s saw an increase in local ministry support. Catherine and a number of ladies from Harmony Hill and the community were instrumental in the creation of the Mosaic Center for Women. In 2007, the church purchased the building on the loop that we now call the Life Outreach Center. This building was used to facilitate our food pantry, which was one of the first in our area and met a critical critical need. You know, this is a, one of the few mentions of Catherine, but Catherine, if, if John were giving this, would be talking about her a lot. Is that true? A whole lot. As Pastor John entered his fourth decade of leadership here on the Hill, the Lord continued to bless in the 2010s. Some of our highest weekly attendance in worship were recorded during this time with a peak of 1,600 in worship, children's ministry, and youth around 216. The church was also expanding its global footprint through sent missionaries from our fellowship partnerships in Niger, Africa, Southeast Asia, Bolivia, and the Pacific Northwest in the United States. The Lord also provided another campus enlargement through the purchase of the Harmony House and the new driveway. This purchase was made when an attend a tender or church member made a large donation and within a few weeks, the owner of the house called the church to see if we would be interested in purchasing it. I'm sure there was no connection there. Uh, <clears throat> the financial donation coupled with some cash enable the church to purchase the property in cash. The Harmony House has provided more space for campus life groups, a place for groups to have fellowships, and a space for having our membership classes. Hang on, y'all, just a little more. The last few years have been a challenge with COVID. 
That's an understatement. And the rapid way in which our world has changed. Yet Pastor John has remained committed to preaching the word, supporting missions, investing in families. During uncertain times, Pastor John has led the church to take states, steps of faith in building a Christian's, a children's building that will allow the church to partner with families to disciple their children for years to come. He led the church to commit $100,000 to the work of Resonate in order to plant churches on college campuses in the Northwest United States over the next 10 years. He has humbly led the church to prepare for a season of transition and leadership. The church has responded by giving faithfully and sacrificially in amounts that even exceed our budget needs. For 50 years, he has been a man of integrity who is the same in the pulpit as he is at home. He has shepherded his people through countless weddings, funerals, hospital visits, phone calls, sermons, counseling, and endless tasks that no one even knows about. His preaching and his ministry to people have touched lives for eternity and in ways too numerous to count. Your story allows us to celebrate our Lord, our church, and our stories. Thank you, Pastor John, for staying and for allowing God to bless us these 50 years under your faithful leadership. Thank you, Dr. Scalin. Um, it's always good to be reminded of the Lord's faithfulness over the years. Next, we want to acknowledge the impact of Pastor John in our community. I'd like to invite Mayor Hicks to come forward, please, um, to make a presentation on the behalf of the city of Lufkin. Wow, what a testament this evening. So many people here to celebrate your 50 years. I'm proud to be here not only as a mayor for the city of Lufkin, but also as a faithful member of Harmony Hill. My wife and I joined the church several years ago. Our three young daughters all attend there, and it's a wonderful church. And I just want to tell you what an impact you've had on our life, as well as so many people in this community, and I would say beyond this community as well. So for that, I want to thank you. I was thinking on the way over here, I think about these things periodically, when people were born and when they accomplished things in life, and I thought, I don't know if you realize this, but you, you moved to Lufkin seven years before I was born. <laughs> All right, here we go. So I'm here tonight representing the city of Lufkin, and we have a proclamation celebrating your 50 years of service to this community. Whereas Pastor John Green graduated from Southern Arkansas University and the Baptist Missionary Association Seminary, and whereas Pastor John accepted the call to pastor Harmony Hill Baptist Church on November 19, 1972, and whereas under Pastor John's leadership, Harmony Hill Baptist Church has been a supporter of many community ministries, and whereas under Pastor John's leadership, Harmony Hill Baptist Church provided a food pantry in Lufkin for over 15 years. And the chamber recognized this community contribution with the Golden Anvil in 2014 for outstanding service to the community. And whereas during Pastor John's tenure, Harmony Hill Baptist Church adopted Coston Elementary to support the teachers, administrators, students, and parents of the school and installed a new basketball court for the school. And whereas Pastor John was a presence on local radio and TV for many years, and he sought to influence the community for Christ. 
And whereas for 50 years, Pastor John has extended his influence in our community by, pastor, by pastoring judges, first responders, state representatives, mayors, city planners, state troopers, teachers, school board members, healthcare professionals, industry leaders. And whereas Pastor John and his wife, Catherine, are the proud parents of two sons and grandparents of 12. Now, therefore, I, Mark Hicks, mayor of the city of Lufkin, on behalf of the entire city council, deem it an honor and a privilege to join in the celebration of your 50th year in the ministry. You and Catherine have made a huge difference in our community and are appreciated and loved. May God, may God bless you and your family. All right, so I've got, I've got a little something extra for you tonight. And I want you to know I've been mayor for about a year, a little over a year and a half now, and I've never given one of these out. You're the first. So, you know, American Express is known to have a black Visa card. Unfortunately, I don't have one of those for you this evening. <laughs> but the city of Lufkin is known to have a special medal for an outstanding citizen. And I think, Pastor John, you are an outstanding citizen in this community, and I want to give that to you this evening. So don't come up here, I'm going to bring it to you, but this is it, so I want you to uh, treasure it. You can wear it around periodically, It'll probably get you in a few locked doors here in the city. So again, thank you. Thank you, Mayor Hicks. Pastor John, Catherine, we want to spend the next few minutes uh, expressing how your lives have impacted those of us in this room. So to the audience, need a little participation here, okay? Um, I'm going to list off a series of statements, and uh, as we go around and, and it applies to you, either stand up if you can or raise your hand as we go through these, okay? It'll be a visible representation of their impact on, on the, that they've had with us all. Um, first statement. Please stand if you've started coming to Harmony Hill since 2010. There we go. Please stand if you started coming to Harmony Hill between 2000 and 2010. How about, yes, please. Thank you, Stacy. How about 1990 to 2000? You see where this is going, don't you? How about 1980 to 1990? How about 1972 to 1980? I hear you. <laughs> Please stand if you are one of the few people who were coming to Harmony Hill before John and Catherine came in 1972. There's more to come. Please stand if you're either saved and or baptized at Harmony Hill in the last 50 years. This is a good one right here. Please stand if you taught either Kristen or Joel Green as children or youth. There we go. There we go. Please stand if Pastor John performed your wedding ceremony. Oh, here we go. Please stand if Pastor John has led a funeral service for one of your loved ones. Please stand if your kids were dedicated in a baby dedication service to Harmony Hill in the last 50 years. Please stand if you were a baby that was dedicated to Harmony Hill. <laughs> there we go. Please stand if you've been on a Harmony Hill mission trip or sponsored to go on a mission by Harmony Hill.
Lee stand if God has used one of Pastor John's sermons to impact your life? Looky there. Looky there. Please stand if you have served on the church staff, either currently or in the past. We have a few former staff members who are here tonight that we want to say a special thank you for being here tonight. Um, I'll read your names if you would stand, please. Or, yeah, that'll be fine. Ken and Judy Weiser, music leader of 1973. <laughs> Bill Stewart, music leader, 1974. Clarence Miller, music leader of 1976. <laughs> Dwight Hudler, Minister of Music and Education, 1977. <laughs> Rusty and Debbie Manning, student minister, 1993. Amanda Hutchison, Children's Ministry Leader, 1998. <laughs> Jeffy and Ben Burns, Children's Ministry Leader, 2012. <laughs> Linda and Cliff Layton, Preschool Ministry Leaders for 30 plus years. Ann Masters, organist. Flo Davis, Harmony Christian School. Administrator and principal, sorry about that. Tracy Brashear, Harmony Christian School, principal administrator. Beth and Philip Johnson, Children's Ministry Leader and Missions Assistant. <laughs> Lastly, please stand if your life has been positively impacted because of the investment of John and Catherine Green. Pastor John and Catherine, you've made a significant impact in the lives of everyone in this room and numerous others scattered around the city, not to mention the globe. And for that, we say thank you. As we continue the celebration, I want to invite Mr. LeVan Watts to come forward, please. And he's going to share a little testimony about the impact of Pastor John on his life. Thank you all. You know, I'll never understand uh, why the Lord chose me to uh, walk with John all these years. Uh, and here I am uh, standing up here. And this is my Sunday school class well knows, you know, I make lots of notes, but I never look at them. <laughs> and this is one of them. So uh, I want to thank you, John, for the privilege of serving with you all these years, I think 47, that's about what we got together, so. So anyway, there's just uh, a lot that I could say about this journey, uh, you know, walking with John. You know, as I said, you know, been here together for 47 years, and he's been my pastor and my teacher and friend, and, and I guess most importantly of all of that, uh, we share six grandchildren together. <laughs> They're down here, you know. <laughs> I, I appreciate that. You know, for Garrett and Warren and them and Audra and Ava and Elena Joe. <laughs> they call him uh, Papa and they call me Paul. Yeah, so 
there was one time, I mean, when they come tearing in my house, you know, uh, never announced, I mean, you know, I never lock anything, so they just come right on in and start hollering. And so they start talking to me, and, and uh, particularly Lana Joe, where she is, there she is. Uh, she'll start calling, and, uh, and yeah, uh, uh, Ava will also do this sometimes, call me uh, Papa. And, uh, and then they'll stop and check themselves and say, well, no, I'm not talking to Papa, I'm talking to Paul. <laughs> and so they correct themselves. But I, I got to thinking about that and said, at first, you know, I said, you know, that kind of puts a little twist in me sometimes, you know, of being mistaken like this for John. But, but when they call me Papa, you know, John, it's an honor to have your name mentioned <laughs> to be in the, in the company with you. And that, that's pretty awesome. Well, anyway, there's a, to kind of keep this, this within a time limit that they gave me. Uh, because, you know, I got lots of stories I can stand up here burn lots of <laughs> nighttime all telling stories but but anyway of all the things that uh, they've asked me to speak about i have only chosen one because at this at this particular time i, I have seen it from my view as a defining moment for harmony Hill baptist church as well as a defining moment for me and what i want to do uh, uh i mean this is not a bible lesson now. this is all part of my talk because what, I, what I've got to share with you, I want to, I want to start back with the book of Job. And now we're not going to start with Job and go all the way you know, through the Testament. But, but start with the book of Job. Because in that, in that book, it, it simply says here, in the, in the, about in somewhere in the middle of the first chapter, that the sons of God were standing before the Lord God. And then scripture says that Satan was standing among them. And so the Lord made a it's very strange. He put a strange question to him and, and, uh, and asked Satan, you know, where did you come from? And y'all know Satan. He says, oh, well, we're just kind of walking about the earth. But we know that Peter says, yeah, like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. And then the Lord says, the most unusual question, have you considered my servant Job? And so what I want to do, I don't want to, stretch anything here but but i'm just i'm just saying like my, my class says now i'm just saying i'm just saying that uh, could it possibly be that some three or four thousand years later that that same meeting was taking place in heaven and the lord made the statement have to satan have you considered my servant john warren green <laughs> so so now before I go any farther with this, I want y'all to understand, you know, that when, when any of us are in a situation or a trial, you know, sometimes it's not necessarily for us. Y'all know that. But God has found that he can trust you and trust me with a situation in our life because he has, he has planned it and ordained it and engineered it for somebody else and trusted us with the message of it. And so we go through the fire, we go through the trial and all of that. And when we give testament of that, there's always somebody that is lifted up or encouraged many times without us knowing it. And I think this, what I want to share with you is one of those categories, okay? So, so here's what, uh, here's what uh, happened. But John was gifted with an automobile. Not just any automobile, it was a Cadillac. You have arrived. But not just a Cadillac, but a Cadillac with a diesel motor. I didn't even know there was such a thing. <laughs> this, this automobile, this car was the source of much aggravation, discontent, and downright anger. Because as it's translated through this whole history of this automobile in his life, it came to the point where he was so angry that he took his fist Boom, onto the dashboard and broke the dash. <laughs> yeah. And so when I heard about that, I was like, what? That, that guy's my pastor. He don't act like that. I said, I'm the one that acts like that. <laughs> I've got a door at the house right now. I think it's out in the barn that I put my fist through when I was feeling like that. <laughs> and so what that did to me was all of a sudden, I'll, I began to look at him entirely different. He's a man just like me. He has a high calling on his life, but he puts his breeches on one at a time, just like me. Now, let me clarify that because God had put a hunger in me for his word, a burning hunger and desire that still lives with me today. 
But at this particular time, I was getting, I was getting hung up on some things. And when this story came out, I realized that what I had forgotten was I knew li very little about grace. And so living with John through that and having him begin to tell stories of his own personal struggles and all that filtered into the sermons from the pulpit. Y'all, here's what happened. Not only was I changed, but people started coming and they kept coming and they kept coming because that's what he was doing. He was taking God's word of issues in his life, things he was dealing with, and putting, putting God's word right on top of his life. And that's what we all needed. Every one of us have struggles every single day that we live through, and we need to know how to handle it. And that man right there was, God used it, issues in his life as he began to share with us, taking scripture and flanging it over the top of it. So, let me boil this down to something real simple. There's, there's two things that, that I was uh, brought to uh, through this, through this uh, story, through remembering all of this. First of all, Jesus said this very simple thing. He said, if I'll be lifted up, I'll draw the people. That's the preaching. And then Jesus said, you come unto me. Put my yoke upon you. It's easy and it's light. The burden is easy and light. And you learn, you learn from me. You learn of me. And then he said, Jesus said again, you seek my kingdom, my righteousness. Don't fret about where you're going to live, what you're going to eat, and what you're going to wear. You seek me first in my kingdom, and all of those things will be added to you. That was life. Now, what did we say about Harmony Hill Baptist Church? Will people come to what? To life. And there it was. Now, it, it's been mentioned earlier uh, about, this, about this little book, this grace for today and hope for tomorrow. And I was privileged to uh, write a little paragraph here in the preface. And I also got to looking through the front part of this, Catherine. Uh, you know, I think that you were responsible for pulling all of the scripts for these, these sermons. But I, I was reading in here that how much involved that... Uh, all of our lives and, and yours and John's life, because you write in here, thanks also goes to Wanda Watson, Aaron Watson, Anna Watts, <laughs> and being a part of this book, and Nancy Pace for numerous hours of typing, as well as Wanda's and Anna's time, and then David Guy and Peter Swanson at Pioneer Design Group here in town, Diana Bryan and Charlotte Engel for putting all the message in book form. So y'all did all of that. And so I want, to, I want to end here just by reading what the Lord gave me to write for this book. John Warren Green, beloved pastor, called to serve, obedient, a gentle, quiet, strong man who walks in the fear of the Lord and pours himself out for a people. He laughs with us, he weeps, and cries for us that we may grow to maturity and stand steadfast when winds blow around us. He has demonstrated God's grace before us and given us hope to go on when we would faint. His sermons come from his own walk with God. He is more than God's messenger. He is God's visual aid. This collection of sermons is but a fragrance of the bouquet that we enjoy. With a timeless, fresh word from the Lord, we are encouraged, stirred to repentance, motivated to a deeper walk, and brought to praise and honor, and to praise and honor an Almighty powerful, glorious, and loving Heavenly Father. For this, we are grateful, not for 25 years tonight, but for 50, 50 years of sacrifice, love, and service. So I got one more thing to say. Thank you, Papa. <laughs> Thank you, LeVan, well said. For most of us, our introduction to Pastor John was hearing him preach. It doesn't take many weeks of sitting in the pew to catch on to a few greenisms. You know what I'm talking about, right? One of those moments where you're listening and you go, what do he say? You're listening. There's a word that caught your attention, right? 
So let's watch this video of a few of our favorites. What is my favorite greenism? Uh, a greenism is uh, a saying that Pastor John uses uh, quite often, uh, either uh, just in life or like from the pulpit. So every once in a while he's shocked by something, like something catches him off guard. And when something catches him off guard, uh, his Arkansas boy goes away and his valley girl comes out. Uh, and he goes, shut up. And it was about like that. And uh, <laughs> I know that I turn and every time he says it, I'm in complete shock. Uh, but it is always used in a moment of surprise. And so he walks into the, into the staff kitchen and sees a big old cheesecake. Shut up. And so that, that is probably one of my favorites as well. I have heard him say it so many times from the pulpit. Did you take a stupid pill? <laughs> he would used to say, like, like a calf looking in a new gate, which is how I'm feeling right now. Okay, excuse me. <laughs> he sometimes adapts greenisms to an individual. And so in my case, um, my favorite greenism is when I walk into his office and I say, Brother John, I need to talk to you. And as those words are coming out of my mouth, it's like his, his forehead starts to crinkle up and he looks at me, locks his eyes to me, and he says, Benjamin, what did you do? Am I gonna read about this in the newspaper? And that particular greenism to me has caused deep reflection um, for long periods of time in my office regarding my true relationship uh, with Pastor John. <laughs> That has got to be, I'm fixing to land this plane. Although, Brother John, in all honesty, there was a lot of times you went to chasing that rabbit and that plane went into a holding pattern and kind of circled for a while, but that's okay because in all honesty, we're gonna miss you chasing those rabbits. So my favorite greenism is from Catherine and um, <laughs> those who know her well will know it and they will know what it means, but she says, that's different, often, and um, what she really means is um, she's not a fan. <laughs> I hope she doesn't get mad at me for sure. <laughs> but uh, that, that's one of Catherine's greenisms that, that I love. <laughs> My favorite greenism is uh, lost as a ball in tall grass. You know, as a guy who likes to play golf, you know, that really resonates with me. Um, I don't spend a lot of time in the short grass, so I'm always looking for my ball in the tall grass. So, um, you know, that one hits home a little, a little too much sometimes. I, a re he wants a response. You know, are y'all listening out there? You don't feel your way into an action. You act your way into a feeling, and that really made an impression because feelings can be all over the board. Feelings don't are not reliable. Uh, thank you for what you bring to the table. It's his way of saying thank you for the skills and gifts uh, that, that we each bring as the body of Christ. But if I had to pick one greenism from Pastor John, it definitely has to be that you are not only the biological result of your parents. I forget how that one ends. It's love making. That's probably the big greenism that I remember. And I like that because it's the truth. Not sure how to segue from that into our next speaker, but uh, I'm gonna do my best here. How's that? No, that's fantastic, all the laughter we've got there. I'm sure um, that Pastor John would be the first to tell you that his 50 years of ministry would not have been possible without Catherine's support, energy, ideas, and memory for putting faces with names. I would like to invite Ms. Teresa Stokes to come forward, please, and share a testimony about the impact of Catherine's ministry here on the Hill. Okay, I have to begin by saying, Dr. Scalin, I just want to tell you that um, Mike and I had the pleasure of going on a cruise with John and Catherine, and his hair never moved in either. So I just want to tell you that. So, <clears throat> so uh, we're here tonight celebrating 50 years. And wow, that's huge. It is just really huge. 
So for 42 years of those 50 that she's been here, 42, we have been here at Harmony Hill and we have been friends. So Catherine, that means I really don't know how you made it the first eight years without me <laughs> walking by your side. I like to tease Catherine that she is 10 years my senior and I remind her of that often. Um, I tell her she needs me for fun in her life and I suppose I need her for some maturity and wisdom in mine. <clears throat> so here are a fun few facts about Catherine that you might not know. <clears throat> She's gonna kill me. <clears throat> She's a very intelligent woman. I don't know if you're aware of this, but she can stand in the choir on Sunday morning for like a short 20 minute time and take church roll. <laughs> she will know who is present or who is absent by looking at the empty chairs because she knows where every one of you sit if you attend first service. And so if your chair is empty, it's very likely that come the next, come that week, you're going to get a text or a call. I missed you Sunday. Where were you? Is everything okay? So now, on the other hand, if you see a woman walking around the Walmart parking lot looking for her car, that might be Catherine. And if you see a woman walking around the, parking, the Walmart parking lot with the Walmart manager looking for her car, that might be Catherine. If you go out to lunch and see a car left running and no one is inside, and it's still running when you come out after eating lunch, that might be Catherine's. If you're having a conversation with Catherine and she begins to look at you with that serious look that she has, she's reading your mind. She knows exactly what you're thinking and she knows exactly what you're about to say and that is a true fact. <clears throat> but seriously, it is a joy an honor to stand here this evening to pay tribute to our pastor's wife, Catherine, my friend. So being in, a being in ministry wasn't anything new to Catherine. Growing up as a minister's daughter, she lived up front and behind closed doors of a pastor's home. She knew the life of a pastor's wife, the role and the responsibility. So when she married Brother John, she knew what the future would hold. She knew what life would be like. In college, <clears throat> Catherine had a heart for ministry, and it was by the Lord's leading and moving on her life that she pursued a degree in sociology, the study of people. She tells me that people were so interesting to her. Catherine wanted to know about people. She wanted to know how to minister to them. So who would have thought that she wanted to study people? Now, it's easy to see how the Holy Spirit, even in college, was beginning to prepare her for the years ahead. <clears throat> this degree would prepare and set her heart for the future. So when her boys were still young, she returned to college to obtain her degree in counseling. Once again, preparing herself without even knowing what God had for the future and the years ahead. Because see, Catherine loves people. And more than that, she loves seeing God work in their lives. Her counseling degree prepared her to do exactly that. She not only wanted to be a part of what God was doing in their life, but she wanted to see God transform them into the person that he had designed and made them to be. It was in my early years at Harmony Hill in the old sanctuary, well, in the room beside it, that there were about eight to ten of us women that Catherine called together and we started a Bible study and she called our little group the Joy Circle. There were only probably eight to ten of us at that time, but she poured her heart into us and led us in study. Even though we were small in number, she cared and she showed us love. She had a desire to see us grow into godly women and had a desire to lead us in truth. So for many years, she has faithfully labored alongside Brother John, participating in many Tuesday night visitations, hospital visits, nursing home visits, 
and numerous other things, all to spread the gospel and to minister to the body. She planned and executed many, many retreats, women's events, and times of fellowship to teach and to lead us in the ways of the Father. So while Kristen and Joel were still young, her main ministry was to her children and supporting Brother John and growing the body here at Harmony Hill. As the boys grew older, God began to enlarge her territory. She took a position with Marketplace Ministries, Marketplace Ministries, bringing the hope of the gospel to various businesses around Lufkin. A couple years later, she accepted a position as chaplain of the surgery unit with Memorial Hospital, which is now CHI. This challenged her and allowed her to develop many <clears throat> new friendships and opportunities to minister, once again, showing her love for others. In 1999, Catherine came on staff at Harmony Hill and was given the responsibility of organizing life groups for our church, once again being used to lead men and women in growing in their faith. It was also at that time that she began to take a more active role in counseling. Her desire was to offer a biblical-based counseling approach to life situations so that began to draw people into her office. She wanted to be a part of what God was doing in their life, to be used <clears throat> by God in their life for spiritual healing and restoration. Many here tonight have reaped the blessing and spiritual healing from time spent with Catherine. Many marriages are together, many children and relationships have been restored and many people are in the kingdom because of her. Catherine's love for women was not only felt in our church body, but while attending a conference in the woodlands, she sat there and began to weep. The Holy Spirit was at work in her. She began to weep for the women that were in need, the hurting women that we had not been able to reach, for women without hope, so with conviction, she realized that we were not meeting the needs of this group of women. Her heart began to long for a place that women in need could be ministered to, women in our community that were hurting and with no hope. This saddened her that our body was not providing that. So in talking with Carolyn Tinkle, whom God had also been burdening in the same way, they were made aware of the Christian Women's Job Corps ministry in Tyler. Soon after that, there were a van load of us women that went to view that ministry. The burden spread. Not long after that, the birth of the Mosaic Center began. To date, this ministry has reached hundreds of women and is supported community-wide. I recently asked Catherine, what are you most proud of, of the last 50 years? She quickly responded, the legacy of my husband. She went on to recount her gratitude for being able to counsel countless people in and outside our church, as well as many women. In addition, another statement to her, another testament of her faithfulness can be found in her family. Both her boys, strong men of faith, who have raised their children in godly homes, she truly delights in her 12 grandchildren. I hear about you quite often. <clears throat> her grandchildren, they're a crown to her. So all for all you have done and given us, we thank you. We know you've sacrificed greatly your time for, our ch for your church family. We thank you. For many times, you rearranged your schedule, you had to cancel plans, things had to change, we thank you. For many times that you dropped everything to go help someone in need or to counsel, we thank you. We know there were times you spent alone so Brother John could come and minister to many of us. We say thank you. We see and know the strength 
as you have adapted to ministry demands as all eyes are looking at you on your life. We say thank you. We honor the sacrifices you've made, not only for us, but for the kingdom of God. And for that, we say thank you. So, Catherine Green, perfect? No. Makes mistakes? Yes. Regrets in her life? Probably so. Disappointments? I'm sure there have been many. Always made the right decision? No. But you were God's appointed provision to our church body for the past 50 years. So when God brought you here so many years ago, he knew every person that you would counsel, teach, and love. We are honored to be counted among those. Matthew 5, 13 and 14 tells us that we are to be salt and light in this world. Salt and light have properties which affect things around them. To be salty means to deliberately seek to influence the people in one's life by showing the unconditional love of Christ through good deeds. Light is a symbol used to mean awareness, knowledge, and understanding. To be light means to be a witness to others concerning the truth of God's word, especially about who Christ is and how he died and rose again for our salvation. So tonight, Catherine, we say thank you. For 50 years, you have been salt and light to this body, and you have served the kingdom well. And we love you, Lady Catherine. <laughs> Thank you, Teresa. Pastor John and Catherine made such an impact on so many people, but the staff had the privilege of working with them on a daily basis. Please turn your attention to the screens as, a current, as current staff members share their thoughts about working with the Greens. So what has it been like working for Pastor John? It's been really good. There are a few memories I have of Pastor John. One of them is that he accused me of smoking. And this was back when we were old building. Well, I say he accused me of smoking. He asked me if I was smoking, kind of thinking that I was. And what was going on is when we were tearing down the old, uh, the inside of the old worship center, we were in the restroom and, uh, and the whole smoking in the boys room. Evidently somebody had been there that was working on the building who had been smoking and really made the bathroom smell a lot like smoke. So anyway, we were both in there and Pastor John just kind of looks at me and goes, hey, and then walks off. And later on, I'm walking down the hallway and he stops me. Uh, and in Jim Meyer's office, he was in there and he just, he stops me and he goes, Joel, were you smoking in the bathroom? I went, really? I said, no, I wasn't smoking in the bathroom. So anyway, he left. And so I had this idea that uh, I would roll a piece of paper up to look like a cigarette. And I actually put it on his mouse pad in his room, just barely hanging over the edge and just kind of waited until I heard him come in. And of course, he walks out of his bathroom. I mean, he walks out of his office, not bathroom. He walks out of his office and he's kind of hunched over and he goes, Joel Don! Brother John came and visited us in Bangkok, and I just remember us going to Starbucks a lot. We went at least three times while he was there, and I also remember us riding in the tuk-tuk, which was like a, it looked like, sort of like a four-wheel uh, motorcycle. By the way, it's a three-wheeled vehicle, not a four-wheeled vehicle, and I always wanted me to make sure I corrected that. And it was open, it was like a taxi and just him just loving it. And Barry reminded me that it was raining the day we went in the tuk-tuk, so it was a lot of fun. 
Probably the most memorable moments uh, with Brother John and Catherine together, and it just really warms my heart when they walk through the office door and they're wearing the exact same clothes. That is what I will always remember about Brother John and Catherine. Pastor John's literally been a part of my entire life. Uh, he was there when I was born. He was there when I accepted Christ. He was there when I surrendered to ministry. I reached out to him to ask what that looked like. Uh, he was there when I was ordained. He's been a part of pretty much every, every part of my life. He even married me and uh, me and my wife. So that would probably be the what I would say would be the most meaningful memory. It's just kind of a, uh, how he's been there throughout my entire life. Um, after my, my youngest was diagnosed with diabetes, she was in the office with me one day, and he stopped her and he said, hey, I hear that you have to manage your blood sugar now. Um, I have to manage mine too. Do you have any tips for me, anything that could help me? Because I hear you're doing a really good job with it. Um, and it was just cool that he like related to her on a more personal level. Um, and it wasn't just like a, oh, hey, I'm sorry, you know, but he like, he met her where she was, and that was really cool. Well, it really bothered him, I think, when he turned 60, and Catherine made him t-shirts that said, it is what it is, so deal with it. <laughs> and we all got t-shirts to welcome him in that morning when he came to work. Every time I walk into the administration building, um, Catherine would always seek me out to um, love on me and to give me a hug. So that is something that I will truly miss. Uh, there's so many <laughs> memories with them, uh, but probably the one for me uh, that stands out above all of them is when we came in view of a call seven years ago is uh, we all went to Starbucks, my family and the Greens, and just got to catch up and really see them interact for the first time and sort of get a, a feeling of, wow, this is, this is gonna be my pastor and just being excited about that. Miss Catherine, in 2015, she sent me, which I framed, uh, she sent me this email. And I don't know if you can see it, uh, but anyway, on this email, I, see I drew, a, I drew the smiley face on here because it just kind of makes me feel good. But, uh, but it says here, I don't know if you can read it, it says, uh, it says you were the best. Okay, I, I'm, I put R, you are the best on here, but still, th this is just, I'll cherish this forever. I can't carry it in my pocket, but I'll always have it. Just, just to remember Miss Catherine. Uh, one word to describe Pastor John, uh, it would be steadfast. Genuine. Consistent. Faithful. Tall. Humble. And compassionate. Wise. Honorable. Faithful. Godly. Genuine. Consistent. Authentic. Unique. So one word to describe Pastor John. Spare the moment. Oh, okay. So my one word is willing to change. That's my one word. For Catherine, I think I would use, uh, can I say grandma? Uh, yeah, I'm gonna say grandma. That's the word I'm gonna use. Foundation. Faithful and dedicated to. Fun. Compassionate and full of grace. Busy. She knows everyone. Caring. I would say that Miss Catherine is very wise. Kind. Caring. Leader. Faithful wife. Steadfast. Listener. Loving. She's sincere. For Miss Catherine, the word that comes to mind is corporate, <laughs> uh, which is um, also an inside joke, but she is on the ball, she can, uh, she can run things. I spare the moment, I mean, just right off the top of my head, ready to listen. That's what I always think about Miss Captain. She's always ready to listen. 
Working under Pastor John's leadership and really just sharing life with him has really meant two things to me, uh, faithfulness and stability. Stability in that what you see from Brother John uh, every Sunday in the pulpit is what I see every day of the week. Um, and that is uh, a man that loves people, that truly cares about them, and, um, and faithful to truly invest in their lives. And that's what he's done for me, is um, through every moment, like literally every phase of my life has been Brother John there, um, pouring into me and, um, and being present uh, when I need him. And that has truly impacted my life, uh, probably more than, I, more than I can ever realize or really put into words. We were commissioned, uh, I believe in the mid 1980s to go overseas. We were sent out from Harmony Hill Baptist Church as missionaries to Thailand. And there's so many memories. And, and, it, and it was shortly after that, serving on the field, I thought to myself, if I could ever go back and work alongside Brother John, that would just be a, a dream to me. Um, and I didn't know if that was ever gonna get to happen, but sure enough, I was brought on staff as an executive administrator and really, matter of fact, my office is Brother John's office. I office in his office. And so this came full circle of ministry where I am now getting to serve right alongside of Brother John uh, and especially in these last few days of ministry and it is such a blessing to me. I, 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 it, God has really blessed me in this opportunity. In all the years here, his preaching, no matter what our family was going through during the week that life threw at you, whenever we came on Sunday, somehow he always was preaching on something that tied into that and gave you something for that next week to go with. Uh, Diane often accused him of having a camera in our house. Do you have a camera in my house? And his response was, yes. And I'm like, oh no. And he says, no, God is you know, my camera. I said, okay. I run on high octane gas. So I am just very fast and very um, busy. Brother John, on the other hand, just runs on premium gas. He's the same today, tomorrow. He's just always um, in a calm spirit. And um, I love that about him. He's, he's never in a rush and he's never harried. I've just been able to see how Brother John loves his staff and how he cares about each of us and um, our ministries and um, to just be able to work under someone who has been in the same um, position for 50 years, you don't see that anywhere. So I asked Catherine at some point, um, how do you counsel day in and day out and listen to people's problems and um, it not bias how you feel about them or about people and um, just life in general. She hears a lot of hard things and um, you know, she gave me an answer. I honestly don't remember what her answer was in that moment, but we were doing something else a couple months later and I told her about um, a struggle that I was having. It was with um, food. Like I wasn't supposed to eat something and I kept eating it. And um, she said, so that right there, you see how that is? Like you want to shake it and you can't shake it and it just keeps coming back. And she said, that is how I can sit in counseling session after counseling session, day in and day out and not judge because um, I may not be struggling with whatever they are, but I have my own things that I can't shake. And so who am I to judge what they're going through? We all have our things. And so just the compassion that she has for people and um, the fact that she truly does not judge and is able to um, point them to Jesus in all of those situations, that particular moment that day when she told me that, that, that really stood out and comes to mind often for me. I've just been amazed at his work ethic, just the way he works uh, week in and week out. He's preparing for a sermon uh, to rightly preach God's Word every week. He'll get uh, behind his door, and I'll think I'm not going to see him again that week. Uh, he'll just seal himself off because there's so much preparation to do. But then I'll hear from him or someone else of a family he's checked on, uh, someone he's called, probably got a, a funeral or a wedding that week as well. 
And so just to see the way he ministers to people so well, but he also is always prepared to preach God's word. Uh, his work ethic just stands out to me and I've appreciated that. He's just a caring person. He just comes alongside you, cares about you as a person and as a staff member, he wants to invest uh, just as he's been invested in. So he is a person that deeply cares about people, deeply cares about people on a personal level, knows what's going on in their life and is uh, a great man in my life, man of God that, uh, that I feel really encouraged by. And, um, and that's been really meaningful to me. Being on Pastor John's staff has been such an incredible opportunity for me. Um, the guy that you see on the stage is the same guy that we get to work with day in and day out. And just seeing that same passion, integrity, uh, and care for people, uh, not just for the congregation, but for his staff, has been such an encouragement to me. Uh, Brother John is just one of those people that what you see is what you get. Um, I have seen him flat out on his face before God, crying out to the Lord. That's leadership. And just to hear him, hear him preach and know that where he's been is exactly where, where God wants him to be. Working under Pastor John has given me the opportunity to work with a leader who cares for his people, not just as a boss or an employer, but he is our shepherd and he does that not only on Sunday mornings, but day in and day out in the office. It's so typical to see him checking in on staff and um, having one-on-ones just really investing in people and it's just really uplifting and building and it shows us as staff how to love on our church and how to care for them because he cares so deeply. He sets an example that is difficult to live up to, but he leads in a way that makes you want to try your best to live up to it. I had to reread this again because what's coming up next, it ought to get interesting. There's probably no more unique view of the John and Catherine's impact than the view from their own house. So at this time, I'd like to invite Kristen and Joel Green to come share their perspective as the preacher's kids. I'm going to let my older brother speak first. And I do think it's funny that he's wearing black and that I'm wearing white. And I just want y'all to notice that. <laughs> so the major dilemma has been, where do you start? You know, what do we lead off with? What do we, what's our lead line? How do we get this, this rolling? How do we do this? <clears throat> you know, we have to, Joel and I don't have a routine of talking every week. We talk randomly. We talk on the way from work, talk on the way to work we talk randomly and uh so we we're trying to plan out how this was going to go down what this was going to look like um how we how we do it and uh because i wanted there, there man there's there so many things to talk about that we want to recognize that we want to mention people um you know recognize dad's in, uh, you know, effect on us as individuals our, our families and uh so I had, to, I had to write a couple of things down. I've actually got three pages. Um, <laughs> it's really not a lot. They're, they're big. Uh, I've got little blocks and then little, you know, thoughts down below it. But Joel and I have been going back and forth this week. And, uh, um, oh, my gosh. I mean, 50 years. I'm 47. Joel's 40. 46. I was going to say 45. Uh, <laughs> He's <yeah>. older. <laughs> <laughs> The people think Joel looks older. You know, no, they I don't. Said he's, he's not. It's, <laughs> he just works so hard. You know, it makes him age quicker. Uh, we can't. Let me let me segue because that can go downhill real quick. Uh, Joel and I get about three days that are just solid, and then then we'll start having little things come up. Uh, it, it's weird. Um, church family, we can't talk about Dad's ministry 
without talking about all the people that have influenced not only us individually, but that, you know, make this operate as a body. Um, you know, dad, dad referred to often as the, the shepherd, the, uh, um, I know pastor, preacher, but, uh, man, there are so many arms and, and hands and legs and feet and, you know, all these different abilities that are represented here in this, in this body that we serve with. And, um, there's some specifically that I need to thank tonight. Some of them are here. Some of them, they've been, they've been gone for a while, um, you know, passed on and, uh, but that I wanted to make sure and recognize as part of dad's, uh, I don't know if legacy would be the right word, but ministry, uh, and that have impacted us. So anyway, do you, no, I've you got, do. I, <laughs> you say, you I keep wrote, going, you're all right, you're doing good. I wrote, I'm actually the better listener, Joel's the talker. Um, Once again, debatable. It's really true. <laughs> Uh, anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll go to something else. I, I wrote down discipline because, my word, do y'all remember those bushes outside the front door going into the old church? Does anybody remember that? Like where the portico share was? I got my rear whip so many times, <laughs> not beside the bushes, but between the bushes and the building. I don't know how mom whipped me in there, <laughs> but she would push me in those bushes, and I mean, wear me out. <laughs> And then she would say, dry it up, we're going back in. <laughs> we'd go back in church and walk all the way down because we went the, down the outside. Man, I got a lot of whippings out there. Um, I've also thought it was really interesting. Dad, I know lots of people talk about Dad's fingers being so long. I, I don't know if you've ever heard him snap from the pulpit, but when he snaps and also says, boys, and calls you out from the pulpit, because you need to be listening to your mother or you're acting up with your buddies in the row, he, he can get you in line pretty quick. Yeah, um, I know I, I talked with Mike Pullen earlier, uh, Jason, me and Brian Golden have got trouble. And why in the world we were sitting on a front row of all places, dad would pop that finger and he'd say, boys, quiet. And I remember specifically one time he came back to his notes and he went, uh, can't remember where I was. And I found out later that Trisha Ann about killed Jason for making the pastor forget what he was talking about <laughs> in church. <laughs> I get whipping when I got home, but it was like, I didn't know my buddies were, were suffering as well. <laughs> but there was a lot of eyes and ears out here too. Uh, I got turned in by a lot of people represented here. No a doubt. lot of them no were, the, were the ones recognized earlier that they were teaching us. And I tried to see everybody was standing up, but I didn't get everybody. <laughs> And honestly, I, I probably have a lot I need to apologize to because I lived <laughs> up to everything people know about a preacher's kid in a lot of those situations. There was a situation, I, uh, I, I was in junior high. Um, I was feeling a lot of peer pressure to get into a rated R movie. And so me and my buddies, we'd all gone to these, uh, gone up to this theater, we're, we're in. How we got tickets to this rated R movie, I have no idea. I am pouring sweat, pouring sweat. And I'm just like, and all my friends are like, what's wrong with you? I'm like, there is gonna be somebody here from the church and I'm gonna get in trouble. And like they, uh, and they're like, Joel, just chill out, just chill out. So I get, we walk into the movies and I, I say I'm sweating. I, I'm saying it's related to mom and dad. It's the Holy Spirit convicts me for sure. But I'm sitting there and I'm like, I shouldn't be in this movie. I shouldn't be in this movie. I shouldn't be in this movie. And I look up and I do not know who it was but somebody from the church was in the Radar movie. And I, I turned around and I uh, quickly got up and exited the movie and stayed out in the lobby the rest of the movie and uh, never went in there. So thank y'all. Y'all were unbeknownst leading me in the right direction and keeping me from trouble. So I was not in any part of that Rated R movie. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Uh, so that, some of that was kind of, not heavy, but light, but some of the good that came out of that, uh, I'm trying to read some of my notes here. There's a lot of men that were instrumental in, uh, like d dad, dad had a, obviously a lot of strengths um, in the pulpit and ministry, but there was a lot of men in the church that took me uh, hunting and fishing, and um, I wrote down something else that, uh, oh, well, well anyway, uh, 
and I think I think I saw Richard back during the line. Richard Landers uh, scooter or a George uh, George Mc, uh, McMillan. I call him Scooter all the time, and you know, anyway, I forgot McMillan. Um, and even uh, A.W. Wright. Those are big guys that took uh, a lot of time taking me out and uh, invested in me when I was young. Um, and Galileans, I know you were in there as well. Lynn Golden, who has since passed. Um, West London, I think he's passed. And then uh, R Roger Officer were also, uh, all three of those guys in fifth and sixth grade were a huge part of a scripture memory that to this day, when I'm teaching other men, those scriptures are what come to mind. When I'm talking to people, those are the scriptures that come to mind. A huge part of my uh, scripture memory was during those two years. So thank you guys I think for some, doing that. I think sometimes people have always thought that our lives were full and mom and dad were always busy, and they were. Um, but as I look around this room and, and, and as we've uh, watched all the videos and, and seen the different things, I, like so many, I kept saying over my I, my head over and over again, that guy taught me how to ski. That, that guy's like my little brother. That guy's like my sister. Man, she was an aunt to me. Like, I love her. Oh, she's so great. And um, it was over and over and over again that I, um, you know, we didn't, all of our family was in, in Southern Arkansas, but, so that, that's my biological family. But my family, the people who took care of us, um, it was y'all. It was y'all making that impact in our lives over and over and over again. And I, I, I just want you to know that that is the way that Kristen and I look at it. Um, this was our, y'all have always been our family. Um, we have a, it's, it's, it's raised me with a unique sense of what the body of Christ looks like when I consider that the body of Christ to me has literally been my family. So just so, so meaningful. Told you he's a good speaker. Uh, I, and I, I do, I, I want to mention a, co a couple things specific. Um, this uh, discipleship has become a huge part, you know, of our, of our church specifically, like just having someone on staff to, to be over discipleship and how important that is in the life of a, of a believer, whether young or, well, especially young in their faith, but just even throughout their faith, and always being taken through the scriptures and gaining understanding. And for me, I can go back to when I was in a youth group, um, and there's several guys that were there during that time. The only one that's here tonight is Rusty, Rusty Manning, but uh, Rusty and Mitch Powell and uh, even Walter Futch, he did, he did youth for a while. Um, when I was first first moved in there, like seventh, maybe seventh through, uh, I don't know, eighth or ninth grade at the most. But just huge people, I would say, in my life that made uh, forever changes in uh, helping understand the word and helping uh, navigate those things. And even um, Mitch took me and uh, Todd Wright and Jason Fullen and just invested in us. And I'm, somebody referred to dad earlier, I think maybe Stacy mentioned it, uh, coming in, maybe seeing dad you know, on the floor praying uh, face down. I mean, Joel and I've seen that at the house um, with dad, but Mitch, Mitch did that with us, with us boys. And uh, I don't know, it was just a, it was a unique time in my life where, you know, it's like I was really learning that and picking up on it. And to this day, still modeling uh, largely what I learned and, and seen at home. Um, but just, uh, oh, and I want to mention, because uh, most of them, well, I guess LeVan, LeVan talked earlier, but some of the deacons, and we used to have a yoke fellow group, which I don't even, I can't even remember how to define yoke fellow, but the yoke fellows were guys that I think were coming into the deaconate maybe, um, but men that, that met uh, on Sunday nights before church uh, and were leaders in the church, spiritual leaders. These are a lot of guys that talk. And they were a huge part of uh, just watching, Family. you know, men that you look up to in the church and mm -hmm. seeing leadership modeled in a uh, spiritual sense. Um, and <laughs> I want to thank you guys for that, uh, that did that. And several of them have even gone on. But for me, uh, watching LeVan, uh, watching uh, Chuck Skinner and B.J. Kyle, Joe Pace, even Mike Fullen, Bob Harris, Tommy Miller, um, Bob Jenkins, these are guys that I remember from a long, long time ago. And, uh, and there's some I'm just not even remembering right now. But uh, I want to thank you guys very much for, uh, for leading well um, uh, in that part of my life. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, that's, that's where I got another at. point on it too. But. Right, no, and then I, I just kind of want to echo a lot of those things. It's funny to, you know, that kind of the deacons were, were kind of like our uncles in a lot of ways. And so a lot of times you were getting in trouble by the uncles. Sometimes you were getting called out by the uncles. They were putting you in line. I remember Kendall Miller and I got in trouble for doing, we were out on the highway. I'm sounding like a rebel child a little bit. I don't mean to, like I, but we were out on the highway. Making me look real good. <laughs> um, they, uh, we were out on the highway and doing something crazy on a Tuesday night visitation night. I guess mom and dad hadn't made it back yet, and Kendall and I were entertaining ourselves on the highway, and the deacons, a uh, uh, couple of deacons pulled us over and uh, pointed us in the right direction. So, that was good. No doubt. Um, I, and I don't know how to segue this. It was, it was how I had it written down. Joel and I, if we were sick, it's like, we, and we were talking, we were kind of joking uh, about a friend of ours that was, they had some sick kids and so they, they couldn't be in church. But I'm like, when we were sick, we still had to be at church. Still had to be at church. I was in, I had the chicken pox and I don't know exactly who it was, but I think it was either Tara Jacks, Charlinda Carter, Kendall Miller or Todd Wright, or maybe a combination of all those. We were all had chicken pox and we're in a side room and they brought our Sunday school lessons in to us so that we could make sure that we got our Sunday school lessons done while we had the chicken pox. Because since we all had chicken pox, we could be together. Yeah, I, I never had a party when I was sick. I just had to stay in dad's <laughs> office and uh, figure it out, you know, deal with it. Uh, <laughs> That's actually a true story. Um, <laughs> hey, uh, I need to comment. Teresa said something about mom going back to school and getting her counseling. And I made a, a groan. I was like, hmm. <laughs> My memory of that, when mom went back to school, is now all of our friends became, uh, what's the word that would be like? Counselees. Like her, uh, her, her students. Subjects. Her, subjects. Sub, uh, there we go. There we go. They, okay. She's yes. like, hey, I need, I need, people uh, to take these tests, and uh, if y'all can get your friends to take these tests, I'll have pizza and ice cream. And, uh, so Joel and I were going out to our buddies in, in the neighborhood and getting them to come back to the house, and it's like, hey, if you, if you do these tests, mom's gonna give us all pizza and ice cream. Yeah. Um, the thing, the thing is, my boss. So I am, I'm a, uh, I'm a director at my work at a hospital in Oklahoma City. And my boss has always called me the counselor because people come into my office for counseling. And so she's even put a tag up on my, on my door saying counselor, you know, or psychiatrist. And i um, always making fun of that. And I was like, well, I did get a counseling degree. And she was like, what are you talking about? I was like, my mom's a counselor. I got a counseling degree from growing up with her. I guarantee you, I know if y'all are choleric, melancholy, phlegmatic, sanguine. An otter, a beaver, a lion. I know. I know what you are. We know. Anybody else know those words? Right. If you, don't, if you know we those words. We were the words, only ones that knew those words. Right. We, we can tell you which one you are. We could yeah. diagnose people, yes. tell them their strengths and weaknesses because of those. <laughs> They're dominant, uh, dominant and recessive. But yes. anyway, yes. it was, I'm good at math. I, I wasn't. <laughs> Hey, mom, mom taught us how to be good at math, too. All that counting, you know, she taught us how to do that, too, from the pulpit. One, two, three, count. Count who all is here. She knows if you are here or not. She's like Santa Claus. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> there is, that's a deep, deep rabbit hole. Um, <laughs> hey, so going, I, I'll, I'll segue to... Uh, the staff, like the, the stories that the staff was telling um, about dad, seeing him in the pulpit and then at the office, you know, and the, the consistency that, that they saw there. And uh, so obviously we weren't on, at the office, but uh, at the house, um, that dad and mom both, you know, the way they handled um, arguments, the way they handled um, life, you know, at the house was, uh, was what you guys, you know, were my word. You know, it's, it's kind of like the old saying, you live in a glass house almost because, I mean, uh, LeVan uses a lot, you know, in his lessons, you know, the stuff that goes on with the kids and, you know, dad uses a lot. I mean, really, Joel and I should get a little bit of credit for a lot of good sermon points. Lots of good sermon that points. That have gone out there over yes. the years. Yes, um, yes. Dad, I didn't have too many indiscretions with the law, but there was a slight 
just a slight, not even a turn in the road, but like a, a, <laughs> a curve little, in the curve, road. A little jog. A little and, jog. and a lot of it was just ignorance of the law, but that is no excuse of the, of a, <laughs> no excuse for, anyway. <laughs> that was probably the only time dad never, he didn't even know what to say. It's kind of like, I don't even know how to navigate this as a dad. I paid all the fines. It literally exhausted all of my summer money. And I'm specifically not going into that because it's like it stirs that hornet's nest up again of those stories. Um, but dad is very consistent with us at the house. Um, and is, is for me, uh, you know, with my own kids and I, y'all, I, I can only speak for me. And I, Aaron and I talk all the time. Like we're still not ready to write any books yet with six kids. Every one of them are different. Every one of them are unique. And we are still figuring it out how to navigate life with them. But thankfully, we did have a good model with mom and dad yeah. Yeah. and Aaron with LeVan and, and Wanda. And, uh, yes. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> and talking about growing up with mom and dad, um, I think one of the things that Chris and I had, we did live in that glass house, but there was so much of that that was really good for us. I think um, there's a lot of positive fallout in mine and Kristen's life. We were both in leadership positions in our work and do things. Um, that was an expectation in our house that we, that, we, um, that we were to be leaders and that we led. Um, and mom and dad put that in us I, I, so many times. If, if something, if I said a word that my mom didn't like or my dad didn't like, they were like, you, if you keep saying that word, you're going to say that by accident when you're up speaking. Now stop saying that word. And they, uh, she actually said, you're going to say that word when you're standing in the pulpit. Yeah. And so to, so to always keep control of your mouth and because there was an expectation that we lead, that we, um, that we, uh, point other people to Christ, that we, um, uh, lead our families, that we lead our families. Well, those are always the expectations that we got from our, from our families. And I think that's played out a lot. I think it's played out a lot in why Kristen and I have ended up having as many kids as we have and um, have the families that we've chosen to have um, was a lot directly related to mom and dad and their influence in our lives. We're winding down. In yes, case you're we're landing the plane. Uncomfortable. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I wanted to say, uh, I will. I, I wanted to, to lead something to that. Just like communicating, you know, with people. And uh, man, y'all talking when Teresa was talking about mom, mom and I have always kind of locked horns. I mean, just Joel was her go-to whenever, whenever she wanted something, instead of arguing with me, she would just ask Joel. Yeah. And uh, we don't I would to... get, do I? Nope. We're still in the glass house right now. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I, would, I would get, I didn't understand the difference between my wanting to understand something and her definition of talking back. And uh, so she would say, Kristen blank, you know, I want you to, you know, do something. And uh, well, mom, you know, I've, I've got, you know, and, and I had something else that I was thinking I needed to do, maybe of equal importance. And, uh, and she's, she didn't want to discuss it with me. And uh, so when dad got home, I would get a whipping. And I, and I didn't know why I was getting a whipping. And he's like, well, for talking back to your mom. And I'm like, but I'm just trying to make sure she understands I've already got plans I need to do. And so early on, I was trying to understand communication and I had it modeled, but it's like I didn't understand their definition of things. And so part of communication is understanding everybody has a different, maybe, take on something. Yes. And so it's, believe it or not, that's actually helped me in life. Um, I probably, ahead. yeah, I probably need to be quiet more, but, uh, it, it wasn't wasted. Yeah. Uh, but dad, dad, uh, dad took Joel and I, um, and I know a lot of times I was by myself with him, but he would take us to, like, uh, I would go to revivals where I didn't know the church or the people. I would go to, uh, well, we'd be at what, weddings. We didn't even know the people. And um, we would go to funerals where we didn't know the, the person that was there. You know, we're just, we would be back there learning if we like coffee or not. I mean, we <laughs> were in the break room, but we didn't know anybody. But uh, it's like we were always in those arenas, you know, where dad was doing ministry. And um, I will say my, my biggest takeaway was in the hospital rooms when I would go visiting with dad. And uh, we would be talking with the, the, the person that's sick. We would be talking with the family. You know, a lot of times I might just be listening, all, all different ages during these times. But... Um, Every single time at the end of it, dad would ask him, 
And, uh, you know, it might be a doctor in there, maybe, you know, different people. But he would ask me, he said, hey, I, uh, I want to pray for you guys. You know, he might say, how best do I need to pray? Or, or uh, hey, let's join hands. But we would pray before we left. And not always out of convenience. You know, it may be inconvenient because of different things going on. But we would leave. And Dad, I, I never, ever forgot. He said, don't ever leave somebody's hospital bed without praying for them. He said, don't matter if the Pope is in there, don't matter who is in there, you pray before you leave. And to this day, I pray before I leave. And it has totally changed the way um, I see, you know, when those opportunities avail themselves and you're able to, to go in and be with somebody. So right. thank you for that, Dad. Like I said, I work in a hospital. Um, that's been my career for the last 20 years. And um, I would say that it's a lot of, the reason why I was drawn to the bedside and to the hospital was directly related to it, my, watching my mom and dad and what they do and how they reach out and how they minister in the hospital. And to this day, now I've seen a lot of patients and I haven't prayed with every single patient that I have, have had, but um, it is rare that I leave a hospital room without praying with them before I leave. Um, just kind of as a, uh, as a testimony to just the impact of my parents on my life. Um, another, another, uh, if I was going to say, um, my greenism, just what, um, uh, dad has always, um, s said in my life is he was like the best place for you to be. And I don't know if he coined this phrase, but he said, um, the best place to be is where you depend on God the most. And, um, you know, y'all are talking about just those moments where something happens and you, you something just, it just sets with you that phrase set with me. And, um, I fight that. I don't like to be in a place where all I have to depend on is Christ, but God takes me there over and over again. And, um, and I'm reminded because of the words of my dad, um, that that's the best place for me to be. That's where I depend on God the most. And so, uh, they made a huge impact in that way with mom and dad. And just as, uh, my final words, I, uh, uh, it's hard to summarize 50 years. I think we've tried to do it tonight. And, um, but I have, it's a, I'm so glad to sit back and to be the son of these people that we're honoring. And, um, and I am a living testimony to my, the impact of my mom and my dad. Um, if you want to look at ground level ministry, what they did in our home was ground level. And that's where, that's the people who took me to the Lord were John and Catherine Green, but I know them as mom and dad. And so um, I appreciate them um, and all that they've done. There's, there's a lot of good, there's a lot of bad, there's a lot of ugly growing up in a church and being a pastor kid's son. Um, but it is only God has used it for my good and has worked it in a mighty way. And I think it's been um, uh, uh, to mom and dad's, uh, as a blessing to mom and dad and just how he has uh, worked in um, Kristen and I and kind of where he's brought us to. So thank y'all. It's been an honor to grow up and it's an honor to call you my mom and my dad. Um. And I, I, I'm going to let Kristen talk, but I think the other thing is that I just want to say before this, I, mom and dad, there is, as believers, we never, until we reach heaven, we are, we are following God. We are doing his work. And, um, and y'all's work doesn't end with a change in position or a change in role. And um, God still has things for y'all to do. And I'm excited to see these next steps and what God's going to do as y'all are also my brother and sister in Christ. And so I'm really excited to see kind of what, what God has for y'all um, here, in, here in these next several years. So uh, I don't think there's a good way to even, even try to re-say that, but I want to echo what Joel said. And just, I mean, thank you, Dad and Mom, for what y'all modeled at home, what we saw and then uh, that we didn't have to deal with the uh, the difference. You know, dad, dad's one way at church, and he's a different way at home. We never saw that, and uh, that's huge. And uh, I know that's been a huge uh, uh, point of stability, I guess, for us, and uh, the stability of the home, the stability of, you know, even though Joel and I aren't in full-time, uh, like, uh, church-type position, uh, Man, I've got so many thoughts on it, I want to say. It's just, how do I best to summarize this? I just thank y'all 
that so many times, if anyone uses Joel and I as preacher's kids, it, it's not the norm. That, and I don't think that's because there's anything special of Joel and I. I think it's what we saw at home, and we never had to had to deal with that difference. And that that's that's huge. And I thank y'all for that. And and I want to echo real quick what Joel said about your ministries, the changing of the seasons, you know, and and the gifts that God's given y'all, and uh, whatever whatever that is. And, and I mean, there's there's all this evidence here, the people that are supportive of y'all, and uh, ready to see you know what that next season looks like. So, thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Joel and Kristen, for sharing that with us. So, as we get ready to conclude this evening, um, we have one more way we want to try and express our thanks to the Greens. So this is a time that you can take out your cell phones. And um, we're going to ask you to follow the prompts on the screen to send one word or phrase that describes the greens to you. As you send those texts, they'll begin to pop up on the screen. So please take your phone out and text your message to the number up here, 936-274-8880. The guys in the back are going to play some music for us. Uh, just for a few moments as we compose and send our messages. Keep sending those texts in. Pastor John and Catherine, um, I hope tonight has been adequately demonstrated uh, the depth of our love and appreciation for you both. Um, at this time, I'd like to invite Todd Kaur to come forward, please. Pastor John, many of you know Pastor John, one of his mentors of the faith and that has impacted him uh, greatly is Dr. Charles Stanley. And so through much efforting, uh, particularly Teresa Stokes and some others, uh, he, Pastor, or Dr. Stanley sent you this book uh, that he's autographed and written a note to you. And so we wanted to, to give that to you, Pastor John, as just a way of saying thank you and from one of your heroes to one of our heroes. With that, Pastor John, Catherine, uh, we're rounding here to the end, and so we wanted to invite you, uh, if you would like to say anything uh, before we dismiss, uh, you're welcome to come. And then Kerwin Smith, after you're done, is going to close us in our final prayer. So can we give it up one more time for Pastor John and Catherine Green, 50 years of faithful service.
Well, um, tonight has been um, absolutely huge for Catherine and I. Uh, there's so much um, emotion that I have I've gone through tonight, the, the laughing, the fighting back tears, and uh, the appreciation that's been uh, deep in my heart. Uh, all goes back to, of course, the initial call that God uh, put on me. Um, that God would take, uh, would take me and, and use me um, to be part of what he wanted to do here. And I wanted to be really clear uh, to all of you that I know that you've shown so much um, love and appreciation to me and, and to Catherine, and it has really filled our heart. Um, but we know that primary above everything else that all this has happened because God had a desire to bless. God had a work to do. And he gave me the privilege of being part of that. Um, God took me from one place and put me in another. And put his hand on my life and changed me forever. Gave me a wife to support me and be by my side to keep me from so many mistakes. Lord have mercy. <laughs> there would be so many times growing up in a pastor's home like she did that I would want to do something and she's like, no, that, you know, that's not going to end well if, we, if you do that. Um, and so I've been so appreciative of that. I'm, I'm, I'm so full. I, I try to think about everything that I could say tonight but I didn't know everything that was going to be happening. And so I just want to say, my life has been, has been so full. I have, uh, I've had the knowledge for the last 50 years that, that God has said, and he's told me repeatedly until I, I really understood it and I quit trying to go anywhere else. Um, that this is where I want you. This is what I made you for. I didn't make you for any other place. I want you to stay. I'm grateful to him for planning us, letting us be here, and seeing all of you. And I know you are a, a large part of our whole family. And so... Um, my life, um, and I'll probably talk more about this uh, as I close out my pulpit time with you in, in the next weeks to come. Um, God's had me on a real roller coaster trying to think about doing life without standing in front of you guys and preaching the word and shepherding you and being there. But I know that I know that I know in my heart, as strong as his call was for me to come, that he has said, you've done what I wanted you to do for this part. And now I've got another one. And I give, I give God thanks so many times for this young man that he sent us seven years ago named Todd Core. That, um, yeah. And uh, little did I know when he came on board that he was uh, God's chosen one to follow me and to take us places uh, that God wants us to go. And I look forward to that. And I will be uh, sitting out there in the chair, my chair. Uh, I will be in my place at the appropriate time, and I will be one of his biggest fans. And uh, I will say amen to his sermons, I already do. And there's so many times I leave and say, man, I wish I'd thought of that. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I could have preached that, I could have done that. So, but he just blesses me. And so, thank you again for tonight. This is a huge honor. Uh, we, we appreciate your show of love and all of you who went to so much to put all of this on. You, you fill my cup again. 
And uh, I thank you so much. This is home. We love you guys. And uh, thank you for the journey. God bless you all. Okay. My wife wants to say something. John said this afternoon, he said, have you got thoughts together about what you want to say? And I said, no, because I don't know what they're going to do. But I do really appreciate, because I know for several months, there had been a group together planning this, and you've done very well. And it really means a lot to us. Each thing that you've said tonight, I appreciate my boys sharing in the way that they did. And it hadn't been so emotional. It's been really sort of okay. <laughs> But there's been a song that we're going to be singing in our Christmas musical that I wake up at night, it comes during the day. Could God really use someone like me? I'm just ordinary. And that is exactly how I feel. That John and I both <clears throat> were just two Arkansas kids that met at college and God led and directed our paths to come here and invest in this time with you people, and what a blessing you have been to us. Just exactly like the boys expressed, you are their family, you are our family, and why would we move off from our family? And sometimes when you leave, you don't know what it does to us. It would do, like any parent, hate to see their child leave. And I, you may not feel the same way, but that's how we have felt. We love each one of you, and thank you so much for how y'all have invested in us all through these years. You have been grandparents to our boys. You have been parents to us. You have been there for us in so many supportive ways, and we thank you for receiving from us as much as we have been able to receive back from you, and I thank you for your love. Thank you, guys. Bless. If y'all would pray with me. And I ask you to just join me in this prayer as, as I pray. God, thank you so much for this time in the life of Harmony Hill Baptist Church and for this opportunity for us to come together and celebrate 50 years of having John and Catherine as our leaders. <clears throat> we as a church family want to thank you, God, for leading Brother John and Catherine to remain steadfast in their commitment to you and Harmony Hill for all these years. God, we want to thank you for the example that they have set for us. How they have shown us how to live a life that is above reproach and how to love the church and others well. We thank you for their faithfulness to the teaching and preaching of your word and for their commitment to ministry, missions, and worship. We're very grateful, Father, for all these years that they've kept us grounded with your word and sound doctrine. We're thankful for the way they've loved us and so many others. God, they've been here for us as we gave our lives to you, as we married, as we had our children. They were there when we were sick and when we buried our loved ones. They have been here for us during all the good times as well as the bad. And as they ministered to us, Father, they always brought a word from you God, we're very grateful for the Green family. John and Catherine, Kristen and Aaron, Joel and Demia, as well as all the grandchildren. Thank you, Father, that they all chase after you. I ask you, Father, to expand 
each one's realm of influence and to bless their individual ministries. We as a church family join together to ask for your continued blessing on this family and Harmony Hill. God, let us set aside today as a pillar moment in the life of Harmony Hill Baptist Church. And Lord, to you alone be the glory forever and ever. Amen.